We can neutralize misinformation through inoculation by explaining the misleading techniques of science denial. But how do you do that in practice? What's a reliable way to identify misleading fallacies and rhetorical techniques in misinformation? This is a skill we all need, as misinformation is everywhere. Hmm. There's a new report out on climate change. I heard climate change naturally in the past, so what's happening now must be natural. Sorry to interrupt, but actually that argument is misinformation. Being able to identify the reasoning fallacies in misinformation is like spotting sleight of hand in a magic trick. Once you know the trick, it loses its ability to mislead you. How do you do that? We've developed a strategy based on critical thinking methods to analyse denialist claims. And I bet you're going to explain it to us. If you insist. In 2018, I collaborated with critical thinking philosophers Peter Allerton and David Kincaid to develop a step-by-step -step method of deconstructing denialist claims about climate change and identifying reasoning fallacies. While the full methodology is more complicated, I'm going to explain the three most important steps to analysing misinformation. Let's get into it. The first step in analysing a claim is to break up the argument into its starting assumptions or premises and its conclusion. For example, the argument you just mentioned has two premises. The first one is that climate has changed naturally in the past. The second one is that the climate is changing now. And the conclusion is that current climate change is natural. Arguments fit the following structure. They have one or more starting assumptions or premises and a conclusion. When you're analysing some potential misinformation, you first need to reorganise it into this structure. Once you've deconstructed the claim into premises and a conclusion, you can move on to step two, examining whether the argument is logically valid. Does the conclusion follow from the premises? In this case, the answer is no. The argument commits the fallacy of non sequitur. Just because the climate changed naturally in the past doesn't mean it's changing naturally now. An argument is logically valid if the conclusion logically follows from the premises. In other words, if you assume all the premises are true, does it logically follow that the conclusion must also be true? For example, take the following argument. Socrates is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. If you assume both premises are true, then it follows that the conclusion must also be true. This argument is logically valid. An argument is logically invalid if the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. This type of argument is jumping to conclusions. It's also known as a non sequitur, which is Latin for it does not follow. Let's take the argument, I have blue eyes, therefore I know quantum physics. The colour of your eyes has no relevance to whether you know quantum physics. The conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. If your argument is invalid, you're not done yet with step two. Before you can go to the third step, you have to make the argument logically valid. And that's it? I'm just getting started. If an argument's invalid, it's often because there's a hidden assumption. In this case, a hidden third premise. If something wasn't a cause in the past, it can't be a cause now. Adding this premise makes the argument logically valid. When an argument is logically invalid, it's usually because there's an unstated assumption, a hidden premise. You need to add the hidden premise that would make this argument logically valid. This can be the most important part of the whole process. When there's a hidden premise, this is often the heart of where an argument goes wrong. Once you have a valid argument where the conclusion logically follows from the premises, you're now ready to move to step three. So now the conclusion must be true? Not so fast. The next thing we have to do is check that the premises are true. In this case, the third premise is false. It commits the single cause fallacy, ignoring there can be multiple factors that cause climate change. So now we're done? We're done. Going through this three-step process shows that the argument climate has changed naturally in the past, so it must be natural now, is based on an unstated assumption. Whatever caused climate change in the past must be causing climate change now. This premise commits the single cause fallacy, assuming there's a single cause when there might be multiple drivers. This logic is the same as finding a dead body with a knife sticking out of his back and arguing, well, people have died of natural causes in the past, so this person must have died of natural causes too. 
That logic is obviously ridiculous, but it's the exact same logic as the past climate change argument. This three-step critical thinking method can be a bit abstract. So let's look at a concrete example of climate misinformation, the Global Warming Petition Project. I'll point to one last piece of evidence about disagreement. Um, and this is my favorite. This is called the Oregon Petition. 31,478 American scientists, including 9,023 with PhDs, signed this petition. It says, in part, there is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of Earth's climate. The Global Warming Petition Project is a website where 31,000 US science graduates signed a statement saying humans aren't disrupting climate. The point of the petition is to argue that there's no scientific consensus on climate change. But is it misinformation? Step one, deconstruct the claim that 31,000 dissenting science graduates proves there's no scientific consensus on human-caused global warming. This claim has two premises. The first premise is that a large proportion of science graduates dissent against human-caused global warming. The second premise is that people with science degrees are experts on climate change. The conclusion is that there's no expert agreement that humans are causing global warming. Step two, check if this argument is logically valid. If we assume the premises are true, does it logically follow that the conclusion is also true? Well, if it was true that a large proportion of science graduates dissented and that having a science degree makes you a climate expert, then yes, it would follow that there was no expert consensus on climate change. This argument is logically valid. That takes us to step three. Are the premises true? The first premise assumes that a large proportion of science graduates dissent against human-caused global warming. 31,000 seems like a large number, but millions of Americans have completed a science degree over the last half century. 31,000 is a fraction of 1% of all US science graduates. Using a seemingly large number that is actually small in the broader context is a rhetorical technique known as magnified minority. The second premise assumes that people with science degrees are experts on climate change. This is another false assumption. Having expertise in one scientific field doesn't automatically grant you expertise in another field. This premise uses the rhetorical technique of fake experts or argument from false authority. When you look through all the science graduates in the petition project, it's full of computer scientists, me mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, zoologists, but very few with actual climate expertise. In fact, 99.9% .9 of the 31,000 signers of the petition project have no expertise in climate research. It's fake experts in bulk. So that's one example of a climate myth that's logically valid, but with false premises. But what about an example that's logically invalid? One myth that comes up every year around the same time of the year is that cold weather disproves global warming. We keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record. I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball, and that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. This is our Fox News Global Warming Alert for you. It is freezing. Blizzard versus global warming. Who do you believe, Al Gore? Or oh, you're freezing butt. Another storm could be headed this way next week. Global warming, where are you? We want you back. First, let's deconstruct this claim into an argument structure. The claim is that the weather is unusually cold and therefore global warming isn't happening. This argument starts with the premise that some parts of the world are experiencing cold weather. The conclusion is that the world is in experiencing global warming. Second, is this argument logically valid? In this case, no, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. Just because it's cold somewhere, it doesn't necessarily follow that global warming isn't happening. So now we need to add an extra premise, an unstated assumption to make the argument logically valid. The hidden premise that makes this argument logically valid is the assumption that if there was global warming, 
No area would experience unusually cold weather. Once we add this premise, the argument becomes logically valid and we can move on to the third step, assessing whether the premises are true. The first premise is true. Sometimes some places do experience unusually cold weather, but the second premise is false. Global warming doesn't mean cold weather is going to disappear entirely. It just means cold weather is less likely to happen. Over the last half century, we've seen more and more heat records and less cold records. Heat records are now more than twice as likely as cold records. The second premise commits the fallacy of impossible expectations. It's asking the impossible to expect that cold weather is going to completely disappear in a warming world. This argument is also an example of anecdotal thinking, making general conclusions from a specific example. Anecdotal thinking only looks at specific examples or what's happening around you while ignoring the bigger picture. This fallacy is like noticing that it's getting dark at night and concluding the sun doesn't exist. That's obviously a false argument, but it's the same logic as arguing that cold weather disproves global warming. Being able to analyze arguments and identify reasoning fallacies is an important skill, but it takes a lot of cognitive effort for us to slow down and reason through the structure of an argument. And our brains are hardwired more for fast, effortless thinking. So is there a way to take this critical thinking method and make it more accessible for the general public in a way that's accessible and sticky? It's worth pointing out the advantage of using critical thinking to debunk misinformation. The computer's talking. No, it's Dave. Where are you? I'm in the Alps. A simple way to expose bad logic is to apply a parallel argument and show just how ridiculous the argument really is. The past climate change argument is just like arguing that because people died of cancer in the past, cigarettes can't be the cause of any cancer now. Parallel arguments are a powerful way to make abstract logic more concrete. You take the logical fallacy in misinformation and transplant it into an analogous situation usually an absurd but real world example. You can use this approach in conversation. Cold weather disproves global warming? Well, that's like saying nighttime proves the sun doesn't exist. Parallel arguments also lend themselves to cartoons. They're not only eye-catching and entertaining, they also make abstract logic more concrete and understandable. It's a powerful way to inoculate the public against misinformation. 